You've just authored a new book called The Sacking of Fallujah, A People's History. Um, why, why did you think it was important to tell this particular story? Um, well, the, the two seizures of Fallujah in 2004 were turned into this big media spectacle, heavily propagandized for reasons that we explain in the book, but like central to that was the silencing of Iraqis and their experiences under occupation. So like just of course they deserve to have their, their stories told. But uh, also, um, I don't know if this is also your experience, but my experience in the US working with anti-war groups, even the best informed amongst us and the best journalists working on the topics, even, even they were fairly misinformed about what had happened in Fallujah. It just seemed like the, the propaganda had just sort of seeped in and become conventional wisdom for so many of us. So, um, I thought it was uh, really important because, you know, understanding like where these seizures are situated within the history of the occupation is really important to understand how it fed into what is called the civil war, we argue is better termed a, um, a dirty war actually, and how it led into the uh, emergence of ISIS in Iraq. It's important to understand. Absolutely, and you are a, a, a U.S. vet, um, and yep. you were involved in one of these sieges. Yeah, I was in the second siege. Second siege. Uh, so, you know, you, you come at it from a very a, a perspective, obviously, um, that, uh, that no one else that hasn't, wasn't involved at that level would be able to express. A little bit. I mean, we're, you know, we, we're writing uh, as sort of professional journalists and historians in this book, there's a little bit of our personal experiences in there. Um, one thing I was able to, to bring to the table was a, a small amount of awareness of what was called information operations at the time, basically propaganda operations. So. Yeah. And Donna, you are um, a peace pilgrim, oh. and you have been uh, uh, a human shield, and you have been to Iraq many times after the hot war too. Yeah. So. Yeah, and so one of my experiences in 2004 was being present in Iraq when the first siege of Fallujah began and then um, having the opportunity, or being called really, um, by doctors in Fallujah to come and see and witness and try to help what was happening uh, there. And so I had the opportunity to get in uh, during that siege and witness uh, for a few days what what was going on. So, uh, And there weren't... Um, many journalists in there, independent uh, presence in there, so uh, that was really important. And so, yeah, what I witnessed and what I was able to document and share, I feel like I, I guess I have a responsibility to share that, that I, as an eyewitness, I carry that story. And and w one of my answers to why did we write this was because it's a story that hasn't been told, really. There's been many books published about Fallujah, all written by um, former military or military historians or corporate journalists. And... The Iraqi voice is glaringly absent, and so this is important. The way we remember conflicts, the way we remember sieges, attacks, uh, is so important. The way it's remembered dictates almost what response there will therefore be to it. And so we are challenging um, the, the dominant narrative of the sieges of Fallujah as they're portrayed in these books as uh, a great victory a great victory over terrorism and saving the people of Fallujah, um, but destroying the city in order to save it, mm. uh, but saving it nonetheless, liberating it, and that was great, and everyone involved was a hero. Um, we, our, The story that we've got here from the people's history is quite different to, to that one, mm. uh, and the sieges have, have turned out to be uh, quite a disaster for the people of Fallujah, mm. to the extent that we are calling it the Herbicide, the killing of a city, mm. and that um, Fallujah was damaged in ways that are irreversible. Mm. Well, WikiLeaks played uh, a, a pretty critical role in keeping the world informed about what exactly was going on with the Iraq war logs um, released at the time. Um, and since then, in Australia, there's the Afghan um, uh, war files, I think it's called, um, with um, a former Australian uh, army lawyer admitting, owning up to the leak. Um, but uh, it's really... Both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are really off the media. So there's a, not a you wouldn't say it's a blackout. It's not a conspiracy, but it's just not being presented as some um, Australia is invo still involved. The US is obviously still involved in these wars, um, which you know destroyed in Iraq's case, probably in Afghanistan's case, destroyed countries really pretty much privatized wholesale their 
their, their assets um, um, and actually created, as you said, more fundamentalist groups and group of schools and... Um, but um, do you think... I guess the question coming from that, do you think in amongst all of this that the, the occupiers, you know, the Australian and the US governments have successfully sold the idea that um, war actually brings democracy? Do you think the public has bought that? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, well, I mean, I think you can point to a couple examples where the U.S. has been more reluctant to jump into um, similar um, sort of foreign policy decisions because of this. I think, yeah, I think the public is, is more leery now of jumping into a military adventure like Iraq. I mean, we know there was one particular moment where uh, Obama was ready to make the call to, to go into to, to Syria, and uh, protests actually stopped that, and we didn't go into Syria, at least for, for a while anyways. Uh, and, you know, now there's continued debate about whether or not the U.S. is going to invade Iran, it's, uh, still to be foreseen what actually happens, uh, yet there's debate, and there wasn't necessarily debate in the immediate 9-11 I think the, the governments and, and media tried the best they could to sell the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq as, as a good thing that turned out well, but I don't know that they succeeded because of um, um, social media and the fact that the real story did come through in, in certain ways. Um, many years ago you would only have what, what's in a newspaper or on a TV reports, but now we've got blogs from people on the ground in places. So there was um, news and stories and images coming out of these places that contradicted um, the, the narrative. So I think um, the citizenry, uh, especially in places like Australia, which are a little bit, generally a bit cynical about these things, kind of thought, yeah, no, that didn't, that didn't work out well. So, of course, you'll, you'll meet many um, conservatives who just ad adore John Howard um, and, and believed everything he did as Prime Minister was fantastic, they will stand by these issues. But you don't meet many Australians who actually think that our involvement in Iraq was a great thing. You, yeah, it's not generally something that you hear. So mm -hmm. I hope next time there might be any chance of Australia being involved in a foreign war that there will be quite some fierce debate. Actually, uh, I'm part of a group called Australians for War Powers Reform, which we are trying to lobby and change the way that Australia uh, gets involved in war. So it used to be just the Prime Minister could make the decision and, and, and rush it through Cabinet and that was it. Mm. So no debate on the floor of Parliament and a vote. I can't even... It's hard, even hard to believe that in a so-called democracy like Australia that that's even possible. Mm. But that's what... That's currently the situation. Mm. And so I think um, if there's any threat of involvement in a future war that that would be... Um, Australians would want to uh, insist on having their voice heard. So before that happens, I think that's something that, that we as Australians can certainly be working on right now to have that changed. Mm. Well, I guess um, it relates to my next question, which is with the sort of likelihood of the, <coughs> of the US actually sort of committing itself to a, to a hot war, you'd have to say, I guess, on Iran. Um, it seems to be having difficulty stitching up a new coalition of the willing, as far as I can see. Um, I think the only countries that have signed up are Israel and Britain. Um, and then Britain was in this sort of caretaker mode for all... You know, it signed up during the caretaker mode, I think. Um, so, <laughs> so um, you know, how should we assess that? Um, I, I don't know how to assess the, the likelihood of this potentially happening because we're not dealing with cool heads within within the Pentagon and, and the White House right now. Uh, President Trump seems like he could do anything at any particular moment and it seems like he's recruited enough similar hotheads into his cabinet, this Bolton figure in particular, a relic, another relic from the Iraq War days, um, such that they make these really reckless and, and unpredictable foreign policy decisions. I think there are still quite a, a number of people within the Pentagon as well as military leadership who are justifiably reluctant to, to head into a war with Iran. Whether or not their voices will prevail, I don't know how to say whether, mm. whether or not they, they will. Well, it didn't seem. It seemed that Maurice Payne, who's the defence minister now, didn't seem to sort of want to rush to 
support this, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder when we just had um, Pompeo in town for the Osmin talks. Um, it was very secretive. We, we, we only found out about him being in town. He's a senior figure in the Trump, you know, the tight Trump caucus. Um, we only found out, you know, they kept it very secret. He, anyway, he was here to speak to Maurice Payne about... Um, about I guess this and um, the rota the new rotation or the increased uh, U.S. military in in um, in Darwin, um, but she didn't sort of sound particularly enthused by <laughs> the request, uh, and so I don't know. You can interpret that perhaps as being, uh, you know, put that in the too hard basket for now. I, I hope that she wasn't enthused. Um, certainly, if she just had a quick glance at history, she should not be enthused because our involvement was quite disastrous and achieved nothing. Um, and, and, and there's just a broken legacy of this country. And so, um, she well should she not be enthused. Um, but I do fear, though, that the Morrison government will be in hook, line and sinker. There's no reason for us to think that Morrison's um, loyalty... Um, to the US alliance is not as firm as any of his predecessors, so I fear that the pressure will be will be mounted, for sure. Mm. Um, I guess um, one of the other questions that might uh, come up this evening too relates to the anti-war movement. Um, I think it's hard, I think, I think myself, I feel that there's a, there is a heightened consciousness about not going into wars, wars that are like following from Iraq in particular, but Afghanistan as well. There's a level of a heightened level of consciousness about this not working, as they say it should. It does. Um, on the other hand, there's less of um, a movement, so to speak, around war-related issues. Um, so, how do you th how do you see that playing out? In if in if, for instance, Trump decides to just simply, you know, target a ship. For instance, they like to just target, you know, they do these discrete, what they say, discrete bombings. Um, how do you how do you see how do you see a movement? How do you see people respond in the U.S. or how would you like? How do you think it would work? Uh, what I'm worried is that we'll respond in the exact same way that we responded to the invasion of Iraq, with just um, moral indi indignation, outrage. Um, and organizing lots and lots of marches and protests around this feeling of, of outrage without being able to articulate um, an actual strategy for changing our foreign policy or to conceive of like short-term achievable goals that we can work towards to get us there. It was always just a very abstract movement to like end war, peace, around these vague sort of slogan moral, moral values. Um, I hope in the future, yeah, we can actually like you know think strategically about how how to change foreign policy. Mm. I don't have great ideas of how to do that, but mm. <laughs> I, I think you know, that's something we need to think about. Mm. Yeah, I don't know that I have great ideas either, but just at this point, we would need to um, look back and um, maybe with a critical eye um, to the last couple of decades and see. What, um, what had an impact in, in, in terms of anti-war movement uh, actions and, and, and what didn't. And maybe do a bit of an analysis and, and look at this. The situation's different now. Back in 2003, we had email and blogs, but there was no Twitter. You know, we, the, the world has changed since then, so campaigning has changed. And look at our, our young friends who are leading the climate movement at the moment, the climate emergency movement. Mm -hmm. I think we can look, look to them and, and learn and, um, you know, maybe um, explore new new strategies and team that up with uh, old strategies and and um, yeah I think being really strategic um, would, would, would be helpful as Ross said rather than just vague calls just really I think it's important to um, outline to ordinary citizens who aren't involved in such issues what 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 they mean what the implications are of going to war what you know the cost and what the cost that's going towards this that is not going towards hospitals, education, and other things. New stuff. Exactly, exactly. So if we could sit down and do our figures as a peace movement and say, well, this is what you're not getting as a result of sending missiles to Iran or wherever, 
um, people are concerned about um, budgetary issues and what affects them. Mm. So, but um, certainly we have a good case of, um, well, let's look at what happened last time we got involved. That didn't work out well. So that in itself is a really great case to put, but to really document that well and, and keep uh, presenting that. Mm. That um, both in Afghanistan and Iraq, for Australians, it has not worked out well. It's been monumentally expensive, and especially in terms of Afghanistan, also in terms of loss of lives, but also with a very, very poor legacy in both those countries. Look at, look at Afghanistan, the longest war the US has been involved in, and look at that, that state of that country. Every day we hear news of um, new violence there. So, no, it, it hasn't worked out well in the past. Why would it in, in the future? I mean, I guess um, the, the connection to the emerging environment movement is a very important one because, of course, you know, war is only going to increase the amount of um, carbon dioxide and greenhouse and every other Absolutely. uranium, depleted uranium, for God forbid, um, and I think in that sense there is a, a, an intersection with, with the emerging climate movement. I mean, these younger people who believe the science and are not cynical can see it automatically. It doesn't need a lot of explanation. Now, I think there's a great intersection between the anti-war movement and the environmental movement that should be explored further and, and, and go deeper mm. because war is one of the greatest polluters <laughs> in the world. And one of the stories of Fallujah is the impact of the, the toxic pollution of, of war in, in an area that was basically a, a city that was uh, under siege and, and the use of, of weapons within that small space and the impact of that has been catastrophic. Uh, but over the world, I mean, look at Syria now. I mean, you could imagine the, the toxic, toxic remnants of the war. It's extraordinary. But not just in, in, in these exact battlefields, but in general, the impact of, of war and militarism on the environment is extraordinary. Yeah. So there's, there's definitely a connection there that can be uh, more emphasised, I think. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, maybe... Um, I think there's uh, something interesting that uh, Ross uh, talks about and is involved in uh, that's related to the concept of reparations, especially in relation to Fallujah, because uh, our, our book is um, activist in nature. It's normative. We're, we're not just saying this is the documented history and let's just put it down. It's saying this needs to go further or some action needs to be taken as a result of our findings. And so I find the issue of reparations quite interesting. I don't know if you want to... Say something about that. Yeah, I, I work for a, a nonprofit called uh, the East Law Reparations Project, and we're talking about grassroots reparations, not state reparations. And um, you know, what makes this fundamentally different from uh, charity, let's say, um, is the, the the act of collaborative storytelling. So you know, we're trying to create a platform for our war victims here to, to, to allow them to tell the story of what happened to them in their, in their own words as much as possible. And I think that's a really important first step to any future campaign for reparations or justice in, in any other kind of form. Unlike charity where you, know, you often just like throw money at an issue without really investigating the root causes, just feel a little bit better about yourself and then go about your day. Um, I was really interested in, in this project because um, I feel, in, as a former occupier, a moral obligation to the city and I'm prepared to work for however long it takes to, to mm. try to build some kind of justice campaign for the city. So um, I've always conceived of this project as a, an act of solidarity moving in the direction of, I hope, a, a sustained reparations campaign. Mm. Well, people-to-people -people solidarity is, goes back a long way. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. it. And when we talk about um, stances the anti-war movement can take, I think um, mm -hmm. approaching our actions in the view of that this is solidarity mm -hmm. um, with our brothers and sisters in other countries around the world mm -hmm. who may be under threat, that we are working together with them is mm -hmm. a really... Um, a really healthy mm -hmm. way to look at it, that we're in solidarity with them and mm -hmm. really can be led uh, mm -hmm. by them. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms Absolutely. of the actions that we might take. So I think that is important that, yeah, this is a work of solidarity rather than charity. Mm. Mm. Great. Thank you.